So as well as the videos you'll be seeing over the next few months from the trip to Australia back in June 2022, in September 2022, I also headed for the northern U.S. states on my way to the Historical Naval Ships Association Conference. And for those of you who don't know, the Historical Naval Ships Association, a.k.a. HINSA, as the name suggests, is an association which is formed of the various staffs of a good majority of the historical museum ships in the world. Obviously, a fair number of those are being from the states, but they have a conference every year. And, of course, they coordinate and try and keep as many of these museum ships open as possible by sharing their knowledge and skills. So definitely worth a look up if you want. Now, specifically when it comes to my visit in September, going through various ships, I went on a number of different vessels, which you will see also going forward throughout this year, uh, along with the Australia videos. But I started my tour over in Seattle-Bremerton in Washington State, which is the northwestern corner of the continental United States, if you ignore Alaska. And that happens to be the state that Captain Larry Sequest of the U.S. Navy, formerly Captain of USS Iowa, who's appeared on this channel before, that's where he calls home. And he was gracious enough to allow me to interview him a second time on a range of subjects, including his time on USS Iowa, but also some more general thoughts on the principles of command and how to be an effective captain. This is in between spending time still helping out various sailors who have served under him in various struggles that they're having, unfortunately very often apparently with the Veterans Administration. So, with that said, let's head straight over to Captain Sechrist. Right, hello everybody, and welcome to another video. Now, hopefully, you will recognize the gentleman who's on screen at the moment. This is, of course, Captain Sechrist of USS Iowa, who was kind enough uh, to talk to us about his experiences commanding Iowa in a previous video, which will be linked below for those of you who haven't seen that yet. If you haven't, I highly encourage you to. And Captain Sechrist has been very kind and agreed to uh, a follow-up interview, so I didn't scare him too badly last time. Um, and uh, we're going to discuss a couple of topics. Uh, we're going to get on to further reflections on the Iowa and the Iowa class later on, but I thought at first, there's not many chances you get to talk to someone who's actually commanded a ship at sea, let alone a battleship. So um, I thought maybe we could start off with what are some reflections for, in your perspective on the basics of how you actually captain a vessel. How do you command a ship at sea? Um, because for some people, they think, you know, you're just standing on the bridge telling people to go left, right. No, don't, don't hit that, exactly. hit that. Um, but obviously it's a lot more complicated than that. Or actually, uh, Drac, mm -hmm. it may be more simple than that. Uh, yeah, the, the standard image is uh, you're, you're, you're issuing orders, you know, that you're this one-stop shop of whatever needs to be done, you direct that it be happen, that it happen. And in fact, I think it's very important to understand that command of, of a ship, certainly a U.S. Navy warship, is something that's quite different. And, and by the way, I think it's the same whether, the, regardless of the size of the ship, I've had the privilege of commanding small, medium, large, and extra large. So mm -hmm. Everything from a patrol gunboat with a crew of 31 up to the battleship with 1,550 to 1,600 souls on board, depending on who was there that day. Um, and the basic work, uh, the, the, the basic role of the commanding officer is essentially the same, no matter uh, what size the crew. And I would say the essence of that is, yes, you have the ultimate deciding authority. And I could tell you about the moment when I realized how important that was. Uh, but what's important is that you don't have to make any decisions at all. Everything that's being done in the ship is being done because a crew person and in my time, uh, the crews were all male. Uh, but a, a sailor, uh, a petty officer, a chief, they know what to do. They're competent. They feel that they're in charge of that job. So when they do something, they're doing it because 
They know it's the right thing to do, and they've chosen to do it. So the role of a captain is to set up a climate in which every, the basically the ship is being is run by the crew. Now, what does that mean the captain actually needs to do? Uh, it, it's less to be an administrative genius at orchestration. It's not like being a conductor, you know, where you, you wave the baton and the symphony all plays mm -hmm. at the same speed. It, it's it's doing two things. One, it's looking out ahead. You, you've got to be the uh, the far-seated, far-seeing eyes uh, of where where are we going next. Everybody on board is busy right now with today, this hour, this evolution. And you need to be thinking, where do I need to be tomorrow, next week? Are we ready for that? Who's working on that? So one key role of the commanding officer is to be forehanded. That term forehanded, I think, is a very important uh, word to keep in mind. Uh, and in fact, in maritime law, the, the commanding, if there is a collision, a, a, a casualty at sea, the only escape of the commanding officer for not having foreseen the problem and being responsible for it, the accountability, is literally an act of God, that it was something impossible to have foreseen. And we've got cases in deep American Navy history where court-martials were administered to captains who uh, had their ships damaged in a tsunami. Well, it's a, a tsunami that came from an act of God, tornado, or a, a you know volcano eruption. Well, if you knew that volcanoes were erupting in your neighborhood, you should have prepared for larger seas. So the, this, this principle of accountability by being forehanded, mm -hmm. I think is a very important role. So number one, that captain's role is to be forehanded, to be out in front of the crew uh, and, and to be so that the, and have arranged things so that the crew feels that they're running things. To do that, the other thing you do, day after day, hour by hour, the pleasures of command, it's called management by walking around. You go wander around the ship, and you sit down, not as the grand poobah captain that everybody has to stand at attention. I do require that when you go into a space. Uh, but once you're there, you can step back and let things go on and listen, talk to the crew, uh, watch what's happening, ask questions, uh, find out that some part was missing. Well, why didn't you get it? Well, then you'll find out that there was a supply problem and you can ask the supply officer what problems he's got. And then you find out something else. So the, the commanding officer, just by walking around, listening, and asking questions, then can feed back to the executive officer, the guy who's supposed to, he is supposed to run day to day kind of things. So that would be, my view is the commanding officer, it, oh, let me add one more thing. Maybe this is, uh, I don't know if it's number one or number three. One of the three things is to enjoy yourself. You need to be enjoying yourself. Yeah, I mean, this is a privilege. You're in command. The, the American taxpayers have built you a ship. You've got this wonderful group of American sailors. You've got something important to do. You ought to, by God, be having fun. And, and let those young men, young sailors, uh, enjoy themselves. They're out there to, they want to enjoy life. They, they want to have a meaningful time. So you, you have an obligation, I think, to to live the idea that, God, this is so interesting. We're doing important work. Okay, dokie. And um, as, actually, this is a question. This is something of I've mentioned in the past to, to people, but perhaps, obviously, from the perspective of somebody who's actually done it, you can maybe correct me or, or whatever. But 
I've always maintained that if you if you are going to be a captain um, or a flag officer for that matter, that you can kind of go down one of two routes when it comes to executing orders, especially if you come up into a situation which is not necessarily anticipated by your orders, which is, I, I call it, you either go by the letter of the law or the spirit of the law. So the letter of the law, you know, the orders say we do X, therefore we do X. And if that, if the orders that you already have don't cover that, then you check back with high command and say, look, we don't know what we're supposed to do. Correct. The other one is, you know, this is our objective. This is what, you know, the Admiralty has decided we need to do as an end goal. And if the orders don't necessarily cover our particular scenario, then it's up to the captain or the flag officer to work out, OK, well, what route can we take from here to the end goal? And then say, OK, well, we're going to do this. It's not strictly in our orders, but this is my best judgment. So um, and I've always said, you know, you have to be one or the other. But you can't be both or somewhere in between. Where would you sit? Interesting, on that? and you're you're raising this point, and there's a different answer by a navy captain mm. and, and an army, uh, you know, counterpart. Mm. Uh, we in the navy, because historically you were out on your own, you were sailing on a distant station, you couldn't ask what to do next. We have in the Navy valued that local judgment and local uh, con constructive creativity. So it's assumed in the Navy culture that you are going to go by the spirit, knowing that whoever wrote those rules never really understood the details of the situation you're in. So I clearly come down on the side of the spirit and the intent mm -hmm. and the local creativity side. Um, the, uh, the opposite, of course, is if you're a shore, if you're a, not a shore, armies are ashore, yeah. but it, it, what it is, seems to be from talking with my army friends, the, the way army units are put together they have to be much more doctrinally disciplined. So naval officers in general don't want that detailed, written, do-it-this-way doctrine. We look, look for a lot more flexibility. Now, here's the modern problem. With the cell phone, internet, the, the admirals are now looking over. They're there. They're looking over your shoulder all the time. And so I do worry that, and I could see it in my time, uh, that beginning to lose that independence, that reliance on the judgment of the commanding officer. I still think that's extremely important. Mm. Uh, but the, the, the advent of the internet and connectivity, uh, you know, puts that at risk. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, you know, they say history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. Yeah. And I'm always re reminded of, you know, every time a new communication technology has come out, someone at the back end always tries to micromanage the ships. Exactly. And it's never ended well, because, you know, Coronel is a classic example. The Admiralty tried to micromanage it from London via telegraph and radio, led to the first major Royal Navy defeat since the Age of Sail. Um, mm. And then, um, actually, again, using a Royal Navy example, actually, the, the in the Falklands, um, you know, yeah, it, it's a war, you're going to lose some ships, but some ships were lost because again, by that point, you know, the, the radios of World War I, you had to be within a few hundred miles of a port. But by the 1980s, we had satellite communications, and then London was saying, oh, no, well, you have to keep updating us, keep getting new orders, keep, you know, but we're basically going to run this campaign from Whitehall and at least one, if I know, I think maybe one or two more of our, sh our ships were hit and sunk because they were in the middle of trying to communicate with London on the satellite network oh, and um, the satellite operated on the same frequency as the radar. So you could have your radar on or your satcoms on, but not both at the same time. And so if you're talking to London and you're on the front line and there's, a missile coming in, you won't know about it until something goes bang. 
Um, so yeah, and then I'll tell you the age of the internet. It's it's the new telegraph. It's the new radio. It's the new satcoms. And yeah, how how much how much of a problem could, is that going to be? Not only as you say, because it's it's diminishing the right. people's ability to command. And but you, then what happens when someone switches on a jammer? <laughs> if okay. everyone's used to being run from from behind, right? And in fact, if you read the news today from Ukraine, you can see that the Ukrainian military really is turning out to be very good at that innovation. Back in the battleship history, you recall on Philippine Sea. When we lost those destroyers, uh, and it was it uh, Halsey was aboard New Jersey or Iowa in this typhoon mm. and lost some destroyers because they the individual COs w were trying to maintain station. Yeah. Uh, rather than just saying, "Hey, I can't. That I, I've got to take care of the ship." Yeah. Yeah, um, and do you, uh, do you have any sort of particular fond memories that stick out of when you're in command of the ship about exercising your your authority as captain or your um, or your discretion as captain? <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. There was with my first ship, the USS Beacon. Uh, there, it was in storm. We had been commissioned in Boston, moved through the uh, Panama Canal into into San Diego, and then. They decided to send us back to the Atlantic Fleet. So I, we had just come out of Panama into the Caribbean. This was the days before satellites and, and knowing from space where the storms were. You had just the old seaman's eye and which, which direction the winds were coming from. And as the storm, there was a huge typhoon, it became clear, you know, east of us. And so we were kind of in in the narrow part of the Western Caribbean. And as the seas got bigger and bigger, uh, I began to think, you know, I need to turn around. You would climb up this sea, that was 50, 60 feet high, bow would come out, you'd slam down. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought, you know, I'm gonna have to turn the ship around. And there's nobody I can ask. You know, uh, so I counted, you know, the mythology is every 10th or 11th, 11th wave is the, the big one. I tried to find a pattern, but then I realized at some point, I simply have to make the decision to put the power on, rudder over, and we're gonna turn this ship. Uh, and if I screw this up, we'll be capsized in one of these waves. So I, I called, we, ship came around perfectly and next day we were running downhill you know to run downwind right decision but I was really aware of at that moment it, it was only I who was going to make the decisions and if I screwed that up I was going to kill some people yeah so you've got the ultimate authority but also the ultimate responsibility right. at the same time right. um, you, you mentioned um, also I think a, a Norva reporter Oh, yeah, I had a reporter on the battleship. Uh, the time that I began to think about this, um, the, the image that the captain is the all-seeing master of everything. In Iowa, we were leaving Norfolk, heading out to sea in the Fay Capes, Virginia Capes operating area. And uh, this young male uh, reporter was with us for two or three days. And so he started up beside me, standing beside the chair on the bridges. We're going out, and I realized quickly that he was looking at me as probably the most powerful individual he'd ever seen. Everybody was responding to me. I was the guy that had the chair on the starboard side of the bridge. And so I, what I did is arrange to, to have him go around the ship and spend the next two days aboard talking with the crew and coming to understand that it was the crew that was running the ship so that he could see the local decisions of what a seaman was doing, what a petty officer, you know, that it, and that, that really was a, uh, an insight on my part that uh, you, you, you need to understand or you need to communicate the idea of what command really is.
so when I did my video on Iowa as a museum ship as she is now, um, I mentioned on the bridge there was this little plate that had been installed and it had a kind of a do not exceed speeds at certain depths, which I was a bit nonplussed about because it, the, the full speed seemed to be for an extremely deep um, it's a part of, the, uh, of water. I'll put the, the picture up in the corner just at the moment. Um, but you mentioned in a, an email to me shortly after that, that that plate wasn't there when you were in command, but you think you know why it's there now. <laughs> yeah, so th there was an incident aboard the ship and I was just reading a Coast Guard, the, uh, by the way, part of the background here, the Coast Guard near here, uh, at Astoria runs a, um, a, a surfman's training where they train the boat crews that do the rescues in the in the heavy surf and they've got in there a good description of how swells coming in the deep ocean as the as the energy structure of a wave approaches the shore and as the bottom gets shallower and shallower from about 100 fathoms around 600 feet the bottom part of that energy cone will begin to reflect and to get compressed as the, as the bottom gets shallower and shallower. And so the wave rises up and crashes on the beach. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're a ship and you're creating that wave and you're less in water shallower than 100 fathoms, mm -hmm. 600 feet, you're generating that kind of wave. Now what happens, particularly with a large battleship with this big flat bottom displacement hull out in the midsection of the hull, you're putting a hell of a lot of energy down, bouncing off the bottom, and under 600 feet, that energy will, will gradually, as you go faster, the faster you're going, the more energy you're putting in the water, it will rise up behind the ship in a rooster tail and then that rooster tail will start moving forward and poop the ship. It will crash down on the fan tail. Oh. That happened to the crew before I arrived. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it happened with Admiral Buckley, the inspector, the in-serve guy on board. <laughs> they were all laid out. They were you know, showing that everything worked on the ship. They had the towing rig laid out on the fan tail and, the, and, and they needed to do a full power run. So they started going really fast, too soon. They were still inside 100 fathoms. The rooster tail came up, crew is it, the, the later told me, but spectacular. Comes up, crashes down the fan tail, soaks the chief's mess, the laundry, almost r r washes the uh, towing rig over the side. It was a disaster. And so my involvement in that, a few months later, now I'm in command. Admiral Buckley, the guy who was the inspector, uh, in-serve guy, he's crossing Iowa in port to the ship outboard of me to do his inspection. And I, of course, I'm down on the quarter deck to salute the Admiral. And as he walks by, he says to me, I hope you know, Sequist, about high speeds in shallow waters. <laughs> I said, yes, sir, I do. <laughs> So there you go. If you if you see a photo or some film footage of a battleship or a large any other large vessel moving at speed and there's a significant rooster trail, that's probably might slow down a little yeah. bit. Yeah, <laughs> and that's probably a good hint that that ship is moving in shallow water. Yeah. Um, so now, if you're in a canal, particularly yeah. Suez, uh, you know, with that uh, square yeah. U-shaped bottom, it's called bank effect or suction effect. Uh, you know, those, so the water will begin to, to disappear from under the hull. Or you can actually, in Suez, the, the water will, will kind of stack up between the bow and, the, and the, uh, the bank. And you can actually lean the ship against that cushion, and it'll push you back, it'll push your bow back into it. Uh -huh. So it's very interesting, the hydrodynamics of water when you've got something like the bottom or the side of a, of a canal. Yeah, I suppose that's the thing where some people sometimes forget. If you're, if you're in an Iowa at, at full load running around, you're talking 55 plus thousand times. About 70,000. Yeah. 65 to 70,000. Yeah. Yeah. And then 
So all of that water, that mass in water is constantly being displaced by the exactly. ship moving through the water. That's got to go somewhere. That energy has got to go somewhere. And it's a lot of energy. You know, yeah. That that could do some serious harm. <laughs> now, the interesting thing about that beautiful Iowa design is, as you notice from the aerial shots, at the ship is at speed, mm -hmm. how there's no wake. It's not big, fat, white water coming off the bow. That water is very clean. So the ship, the reason it was so fast is because that hull design uh, did not waste energy by pushing water mm -hmm. uh, out around the bow. Very fine. It even had that bulb bow, mm -hmm. uh, later we knew as the Esso bow. Mm -hmm. Very water. fine, very fine bow. Very fine bow. And in fact, the beamiest part of the ship, the sides of the ship were actually not uh, straight. It, the ship still was angled out all the way back to almost turret three. It was like an arrow shape, uh, if you if you looked at the prints. Yeah, yeah. Because if, if you look at it from a, just a, a generic eye view, it looks like the the bow flares until maybe turret two, and then it's kind of slab sided. Exactly. Um, but from what you're saying, it's it, 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 it is actually, kind of slab side, but still is actually. It carries slightly. out that beam is still getting broader. Mm. Uh, all the way back to the editor in the deck house. Ah, now that's, no, that's interesting. So I suppose that leads us on to reflections on the, the Iowa class as a whole uh, and an, sort of an appreciation of what they, are, what they were as, as engineering and naval maritime right. feats. So, uh, yeah, w what, do you, what do you think of the Iowas, I guess, when you commanded them compared to when they were built, compared to maybe even now? The, let, let me start, uh, Drek, with the, the idea the ships were actually built 50 years too soon. These were not dinosaurs. Uh, you know, in the 1980s, I told people, this is not a dinosaur from designed in the 30s, built in the 40s. Um, it actually was built, it was way ahead of its time. The Iowas, in my view, if we had them in the fleet today, would be wonderfully useful. They would actually be maturing right now at the time they were built for. And the reason for that is that because of these various qualities, uh, the combination of high speed, large volume, the armor. So they, they've got, first of all, they're impressive. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, if you're making an important statement with a battleship. And a way to think about that is to think about the White House. In the Situation Room in the White House, there's obviously a chart with where the carriers are and who the big, the big pieces on the chessboard, on the global chessboard that the President and the White House is watching. If you've got, and carriers are on that, chess, on that mm -hmm. board, they're, they're major players. With a battleship, the President has another chess piece. It's a significant step. It doesn't require use, a, you know, use an aircraft carrier. It's another option for for moving, but it's clear to everybody in the world, including the country off whose shores you're stationing the battleship, that you made a significant move. And you, with with the missiles, the guns, you are still very relevant. Look at the, how much gunnery. It is is turning out to be very important in Ukraine in that war with Russia. So my view is that the battleships, I wish we could put them back in service right now. <laughs> they would be wonderfully useful. And um, the, the reason for that is because they are this symphony of firepower with the 16-inch guns. Uh, these days, we, sh we should be able to reach 100 miles with those guns. Uh, particularly if you had laser-guided, uh, you know, shells. Yeah. It could be extraordinarily accurate with those 16-inch shells. Uh, you carry 2,000 of them. Another thing the battleship has is staying power. It's not just that you can go and shoot. You've got enough fuel, you've got the armor, you've got self-repair capability so that you can stay on station. You're, you're not just going to... You send an airplane, it's got to fly home and mm -hmm. as soon as it needs to refuel. That battleship is going to stay with you uh, for quite a while. 
and it's self it's got this self repair capability. Yeah, so nature. I see the battleships uh, when we use them in the eighties, and I wish we had them around mm -hmm. right now. And one more thing that the battleship people talk about modular ships, you know, I want to mm. change capabilities like the ill fated uh, LCS <laughs> uh, ships that were supposed to be modulized. That big hull is very accommodating to capabilities you want to change. With computers, we changed the combat system every time we came in port. We would bring the techs aboard, reprogram the software. So you can really change your ship uh, and, and update it these days mm -hmm. uh, easily. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm thinking I was actually having this conversation with a, someone else a um, couple of days ago at the time we are filming this, we, especially when you think about, I suppose, if you're putting it in a modern application, we've now got these surface-based unmanned vessels, um, which, to be fair, it's not really a new concept. We've had fire ships at the time of the Spanish Armada. They hung around for pretty much the age of sail. Um, theoretically, the early torpedoes are pretty much very similar, even the torpedo boats themselves. Um, in the Civil War, the Hunley, sure. again, I mean, all of these things had men on board because they hadn't managed how to automate them yet. Uh, but, you know, the, the idea of sailing up close to your enemy with a large quantity of explosive in a small expendable vessel, you know, they had them both manned and unmanned depending on the Navy in World War II. Um, but a large omnidirectional explosion of high explosive is exactly what the armor of a battleship on the waterline is designed to defeat, yeah. as well as armor-piercing shells. Right. So, you know, you know, a lot of modern ships you put a 400 pounds of high explosive next to it and set off the trigger and it's got a massive hole in it exactly i mean we, we even the uss cole famously back in the 90s got hit by something like that if you did that to an iowa i mean okay this with the sloping armor you'd get a little bit of outer flooding but it's not going right. to compromise the integrity right. of the ship um which it, you know maybe we'll see armor come back in that context and we did as you recall we we pioneered the, the pioneer uh, we called them RPVs at the time, mm. remotely piloted vehicles, uh, UAVs or drones mm. these days. But Iowa, we flew the first uh, operational drones in, in for the U.S. military. And uh, we had to crash a few. It took us a while to figure out how to do it, uh, make all the electronics work. But by the time we were out in the Persian Gulf with Operation Ernest Will, uh, we were using those routinely. And I was learning how valuable it is to do gunnery with your own own eyes looking down on the target, uh, to use IR uh, cameras so that you can look at the hull, uh, the internal temperatures of another ship's hull. You can actually map the inside of a ship by looking at the engine spaces, heat, and so on. Yeah, and I suppose as, well, as the eye was proved in the 80s, they, were, they came out of mothballs with 25-inch guns and no missiles, and by the right. time they'd finished their refit, they had, they'd gone down to 12 gun, 12 5-inch guns, but they now had tomahawks and harpoons. So I suppose, strictly speaking, there's, yeah, as you were saying with the modular, modular ideas, the square cube law is everybody's friend. There's so much space there, you could in theory, if you didn't want to put harpoons and tomahawks right. there, you could have something else there, some kind of missile system, whether that be as surface-to-air missiles or what? Uh, what's it, the um, the Na is it naval strike missile, NSM, the sure. ones they're coming out with now. Yeah, you can um, do those. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, of course, there's there's other things as well that, that a battleship can do because, again, of its, its sheer size and... It, the, 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 obviously, you've got a lot of people on board, but um, that gives you a lot of flexibility that perhaps other ships can't have. You've got a, a few anecdotes you mentioned about um, uh, about various instances that you found yourself in, <laughs> um, like uh, uh, helping Honduras, for example. Sure, uh, you know, and uh, one minute, it's, I, I want to come back also to. Um, this idea of the captain not being the authoritarian dictator. 
especially in the American Navy, this leads into this sea story, uh, it's very important for an American Navy captain to remember that those crew members are your fellow citizens. They vote, they pay taxes, and in some sense, you are all just fellow citizens. Um, other navies may have other cultures. You can certainly see it in the Russian military right now, this dreadful, uh, completely different kind of culture. Now, um, Honduras, an example of how you use those sailors' human capabilities and the ship. I recall we were down in the Caribbean uh, as often in January, like the fleet exercises. Right after the Christmas holidays, the, the Navy always liked to get underway and head for the Caribbean. And uh, we were down, uh, made a port call in uh, Honduras, and I, with my helos, uh, we flew uh, the dentists, doctors, uh, I don't know what the numbers, 15 or 20 members of the crew, electricians, uh, some bosun made painters, and they overhauled an orphanage, did a couple of other buildings. Uh, the chaplain, uh, we had a Catholic chaplain on board. Uh, we had, uh, did the dentist, had their portable dentist, uh, dentistry capability. They did a lot of teeth and things like that. So that the, sh the ship was able just by arriving off the coast of a country to deliver a kind of America to citizen to citizen impact that I think is extremely important today. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's focusing on turning the Chinese in, into the next war uh, with the American military. Mm -hmm. uh, my view, we ought to be using our crews uh, that same way. And of course, the crew really enjoyed that. They really liked that ability to go ashore and do something useful in another country, another village. And I suppose that, again, it speaks to the capability of a battleship because if you've got some, if you've got either an Iowa or something similar to it out there, you're not having to take your carrier and your 70-odd right. strike aircraft off the front line. And ultimately, for all their capabilities, an FA-18 or an F-35 right. is not the world's best humanitarian aid platform. Right. <laughs> um, but you've got a large crew, you've got a lot of cargo stores capacity, so you can so you can be there, you can be there for a while, you've got, and you can carry the supplies that are necessary to help out, you've got the manpower right. that's necessary to help out, you've got the command and control capabilities to help right. out. And that's something that's not really reflected in almost any other ship in the Navy. So, what that turns out to be, is, I think it was the school of the ship. Mm. Uh, a battleship is a finishing school. Because you've got all of this khaki, uh, you know, master chiefs, warrant officers, limited duty, LD, LDOs, you've got all these people on board who are extremely skilled. And you have the full range of everything from dentists, you know, artificers of, of various kinds. You've got enormous range of skills on board. So a young sailor is going to go to sea and learn what everything the ship can do and learn it from exports, experts. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I really think a major value of a, of a capital ship like a battleship is that it's a, it's a finishing school for sailors and for young officers. Uh, you need, people need to go to sea to learn to go to sea. Mm. And uh, that the, the battleship, if it did nothing else, it would be invaluable in that role. Okay, okay. So there we go, some, some more reflections on the Iowas as battleships. Okay. And some reflections on how you are uh, how, how to be a good captain at sea. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, Captain Sequist, for giving us your time again. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk again at some point in the future. I look forward to it. Various other things. And uh, if anyone has any questions for Captain Sequist, obviously mention them in the in the comments below. Maybe that'll be the next thing we can do. Co questions from comment... Uh, questions. 
comments, I don't know, questions from comment? No, it'd be comments from questioners, wouldn't it? Questions from commentators. I suppose it's the same thing. If they, ha if they have questions they'd like to ask you, then maybe Great. we can pick a short list. Certainly. And uh, then, then you get to know what, what it's like, the, the, your, your answers directly from what it was actually like to do it. <laughs> have you got time for the crazy chaplain story? Oh, yes. Go then. Okay. So, Battleship Isle, we've finished our duty for three months. We've been in the Straits of Hormuz, and our role is to express to the Iranians the sincere desire that they not shoot the tankers as they try to export oil through the Straits of Hormuz. That's all very successful. And we're on our way home. We're coming in the Red Sea back up to Suez. So I find that I'm in company with two British destroyers that are headed also for Suez, transit it just like I am. And of course, we fall in with each other and start you know, uh, doing a few exercises together. And one day, we're, it was only two, three days up the Suez, Red Sea. So we're going to do a high line exercise where we the ship they come alongside and we rig the high line the british use a different we use a bosun's chair where we put the person being transited uh, transferred to the other ship in this chair and the brits use a little t-bar you stand on it hang on just zip over it's actually more efficient and so what we did is we got a chief bosun mate and we dressed him up. We put on his khaki uniform. He had captain's eagle on one collar and a chaplain's cross on the other collar. So we dressed him up as a captain chaplain. Put his life jacket on. He goes down to the, the station and we zip him over on the high line to the Brits. And as he gets over there, I've got a sound powered phone system. I've got my sound powered phone line to the other bridge. And as he goes across, I say, I can say, Captain, I'm really sorry. I've got <laughs> this crazy chaplain. As the chaplain, the, the fake chaplain, gets off on the other side, he pulls off his life jacket. They can see he's a Captain Jack, a senior officer, and says, where the hell can I get a beer? <laughs> and disappears, runs off. And so I'm telling the captain, he says, I'm so sorry. We've had this crazy chaplain, I'm responsible for getting him back home. They asked me to take him back to the States. <laughs> Can you catch him and send him back to us? So they had a great time. The chief had a beer with the Brits and then sent him back over. So that way, we had a good time with that. Oh, it's great. always fun to meet a British ship because you're going to have you're going to have a good time. And I, I think this is one of the key things that certainly in the research that I've done looking at anecdotes and experiences from sailors throughout time is that a sense of humor is absolutely key. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, you know, people sometimes like to imagine, you know, oh, everyone's in the military. Everyone's very serious, very all the time. You know, yes, sir, no, sir, three bags full, sir, I'm doing my duty, etc. It's like, no, <laughs> people do their jobs, but you do it with a smile and a, and a good sense of humor and a bit right. of a laugh. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. for sure. All right. Well, thank you very much once again. Okay. And uh, yeah, comments below, everyone. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.